you know, the myth holds that liberalism begins with the death of kings, that you know, you cut off the head of the king, as Cromwell so elegantly said, with a crown on it, um, and aristocracy vanishes, perhaps, as Tocqueville claims, in a kind of mist of lost elegance, perhaps, as Paine wrote, through being laughed at. And the dialectic of history advances inexorably from a feudal order of peasant and lord to the confrontation of proletariat and bourgeoisie. But I think not. I think we are still enthralled to the feudal order. In our imaginary, certainly, I mean, think of all those little princesses. Um, but more powerfully and pervasively in our laws and in our conception and structuring of executive authority. The present moment seems all too forcefully to argue that monarchical authority persists, um, that Donald Trump has monarchical pretensions is readily recognized, um, but I couldn't resist giving you little pictures anyway because they are fun. This is my favorite, actually. Um, there are so many of them. <laughs> oh, I wait till you see what I've got for you. You're going to be so happy, or at least I'm happy. Now, monarchical pretensions are neither un unprecedented nor unprecedented. Andrew Jackson, FDR, Lincoln, um, Nixon, Nixon, sorry. But, um, and that's natural because the specter of tyrannical kingship naturally is going to haunt rebellious colonies even after their independence. We use the king, name of king to chasten presidents, to warn them to walk carefully, and at our best we still regard kingship as a crime. Um, but I think there's much more than this going on with Trump. I think in Trump's pattern of pretensions and presumptions, we can read a map of the sites where a feudal politics persists. Uh, monarchical power is fundamentally power in the blood, power installed in a body, not in laws or institutions, and least of all in the people. Trump has made no secret of his disdain for judges who disagree with him, lawyers who contest his edicts, and laws that stand in his way. He has installed his children, qualified by nothing but birth, in public office. He has been insistent in putting his body, his impositions on unwilling women, his tiny hands, his remarkable hair, um, before a global audience. It must be not about the office, but about him. And this is hardly surprising. Monarchical power persists at every site that Trump has inhabited. He simply knows nothing else. Um, he knew the family, inherited status, inherited wealth, what Aristotle called an animal form of authority. This has been transferred to the executive branch, and it maintains its presence in his, in his understanding of how the executive branch should work. This is the one I, I can't resist this one. And I, anyway, I will get back to this one in a second. Now we have uh, the slumlords standing behind um, the, what, what shall we call him, the head of state. Um, so Trump cannot distinguish easily between public and private goods. Neither can his cabinet. This is the remarkable Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, and his actress wife, who has been referred to in various articles as Marie Antoinette for her arrogant appropriation of uh, airplanes and other of the goods of the, um, of the office. It's not surprising, therefore, that he feels most at home with monarchs. Um, but Trump is not simply a political anomaly. I think he's sympathetic, sorry, symptomatic. He's symptomatic of the prevalence and the persistence of feudalism in the economy, in sex, sexuality, in the family, and in race. Um, the most interesting of these is the economy. That the corporation is fundamentally a feudal institution. It's ruled monarchically with aristocratic categories. It's governed by labor laws. And here, I'm relying heavily, much more heavily in the paper on, on Karen Oren and Karen Oren's brilliant book, Belated Feudalism, in which she points out, you can't say she argues, she doesn't argue it, she just shows you, um, that American labor law and, Brit and the British common law on which it was founded are fundamentally importations of the feudal law of master and servant. It never went away. It didn't even change very much. So, so are the, 
the form of the corporation derives from two things in medieval law, the, corp the law of master and servant, and of course, the corporation of the church. Again, one in which power rested in blood, albeit blood of a somewhat more flexible sort. Um, in Trump's business, he rules that way. He rules as a king. His word is law. He fires his will. And he believes his, his role as owner, owner gives him a kind of droit de seigneur over women's bodies. There was, these are all Trump quotes, you know, no men are anywhere. Uh, and I'm allowed, this is, sorry, the Miss Universe pageant. And I'm allowed to go in because I'm the owner of the pageant. You know, they're standing there with no clothes. In 2005, he told Howard Stern, as the pageant's owner, it might be my obligation to sleep with the contestants. And of course, there's the famous grab them by the pussy. Now, at these sites, and in the economy more broadly, ostensibly natural rights stop at the factory door. It's not just that he claims this droit de seigneur, it's that he has lordly power over everyone. And this is true not just for Trump, but indeed for the way the economy is run in the United States and the West, as to say under capitalism. You're, you may have natural rights, the Constitution, or your rights as a citizen of the UA may guarantee, guarantee you certain rights, but they stop. They stop at the shop door, they stop at the factory, they have no presence in your economic life, and you can in no way appeal to your freedom of speech, your freedom of access, your rights to protest, or any of the rights that we derive from the, from the Enlightenment in your economic, in your economic life. Um, so these, and the relations that govern economic life are also hierarchical and arbitrary. There are some regulations, as there are in a constitutional monarchy, perhaps, or in customary law, but not many. You can be fired. You can be fired at will. Um, and the relations are profoundly hierarchical, and the, hierarch the hierarchies need no external guarantee. They need not be meritocratic. They can simply be by the owner's choice. So all the values and mores are much more feudal than they are enlightened. They're non-meritocratic. They privilege loyalty. And um, thinking of Sophie's presentation, they depend on lying, that some people are just worth more than others. So we've, in keeping economic institutions separate from liberal institutions, we've preserved things that are modern in name but feudal in structure that preserve all the hierarchies, all the irrationalities of the feudal order. So let me move then to the greatest and I think the most powerful of feudal norms, power in the blood. This is the base of all feudal claims to status, deference, and power, and it is the one that I believe to me most profoundly and most thoroughly a lie. And I would argue that these, the most intimate inscriptions of feudalism remain. Power in the body didn't pass away. It merely changed its form. It used to be that your claim to title and deference, the claim to be a lord, the claim to say, kiss my ring or perform labor for me, um, that these were once written in the blood and they were inscribed on the body through sumptuary laws. But now they are much more economically inscribed on the body itself. The stigmata of race and sex marked a new form of power in the blood. The title to command was no longer, I am your lord, but I am white, or I am your husband. Richard Spencer's affirmation of white supremacy, gussied up with a little Hegel, initially appears rooted in cultural superiority, but it ends exactly there, in power in the blood. This is Spencer. I would say that white Americans, European Americans, in particular Anglo-Saxon Americans, Anglo-Saxon Protestants, were this his essentially historic people, that they defined it in a way that no other people did. We are, as Hegel recognized, the concept of world history. Within the very blood in our veins, as children of the sun, lies the potential for greatness. Racial hierarchies are feudal residue. Old apologies for domination cast in an only slightly new idiom. They are not, however, only the residue of feudalism. They are a liberal pathology. In this, I depart from my friend Roger Smith, who argues that these are an alien tradition contending with liberalism. I think they're integral to liberalism from the start. One sees them in Locke's defense of slavery, in Mill's defense of empire, in Tocqueville's animate versions on the Negro race, and his declaration that the more thorough subjection of women in America was proof of the success of liberalism.
Charlottesville. Eric Garner died as a policeman held him in a chokehold. He was suspected of selling cigarettes illegally. In other words, he was a peasant, killed for poaching the Lord's game. The, lo the laws that enabled Garner's death served capital as other laws once served the Lord. The holdings of the privilege command deference, the lives of the poor are forfeit. One could argue that race is superfluous here that Garner's death was an exaction of capitalism, not white supremacy, but I think it's impossible to tell them apart. Slavery bound race and capital together in America and elsewhere. Slaves were African-American and earlier indigenous people. African-Americans could be owned. Race was, is, power in the blood. A hierarchy read onto bodies, a text written and read on those bodies is the text of embodied privilege. But race also marked the site, though not the only site, where the rights of man gave way to the power of money. Black bodies could be traded, placed on the market, valued and exchanged, or used as capital for loans, and in the case of Judah Benjamin, um, stock in the Illinois Central Railroad. The market shows itself here not as a place of choice and freedom, but as a site of the most complete dominion. Now, it goes without saying, I hope, that power in the blood, the hierarchies of race and class in their modern form have not gone uncontested. Feudalism does not so survive in liberalism solely as a countervailing tradition, remnant, and residue. One of the great and terrible ironies of the liberal tradition in America is the extent to which it perpetuated the inequalities of the feudal order, albeit in this altered form. The persistence of the feudal suggests that the arc of history does not inevitably bend toward justice, that the consoling myths of inevitable linear progress are not wholly reliable. Where the feudal order remains intact, we are walled within it. Where the feudal order has broken, we move forward only to cut our feet on shards. The revolutions that affirmed the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the greatest he, and that all men are created equal, have not achieved their aims. The simple democratic demand remains. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, before I start my paper, I want to just express a pet peeve of two of my colleagues here, uh, Dr. Casimus and Dr. Chevelle. Um, in their brilliant presentations, they actually usurped a good chunk of my presentation. So, so what this means is whereas I would normally exclude the range of examples I wanted to talk about, I'll actually include them, but I think it will actually provide a nice contrast and some empirical examples of the large arguments I'm making in my book, The Specter of Race, How Discrimination Haunts Western Democracy. Uh, I'm going to make some claims about democracy that will seem to many ears counterintuitive, if not outright wrong. In various locales of the contemporary world, the trampling of rights of groups and individuals because of religious, ethno-national, gendered, and presumed racial differences has become depressingly commonplace. For many observers, ethnic cleansing, xenophobia, and religious intolerance are characteristics, or historically been characteristics, of non-democratic countries and regimes. But when such phenomena can be found in nominally democratic societies and polities, how do we distinguish democratic societies from non-democratic ones? In this brief set of comments from my new book, I'll emphasize three key concepts which will hopefully enable the audience to distinguish democracy as a philosophical concept from democracy as a set of practices with a specific set of actors, institutions, and motivating logics. And those three concepts I will unfold in this paper are ethnos, the idea of ethnos, uh, here I was inspired in part by uh, Etienne Balibar's book, We the People of Europe. Uh, secondly, the myth of homogeneity. Uh, and thirdly, autochthony. Point one, most, if not all democracies, beginning with the first, has operated within an ethnos, a complex of laws, customs, norms, and when necessary, coercive and exclusionary 
practices designed to privilege certain populations and not others. Point two, homogeneity, has been a long underlying principle in the most robust, most continuous democratic politics in the world. Namely, a tendency for governments and key political actors to believe that the ideal society, the one prone to less political misfortune and mishap, is one where the demographic constitution of government is identical or close to identical with the governed. Rather than focusing either on lone gunmen, members of far-right organizations who can be labeled at the level of individual sociopaths, evil and psychotic, I'd like to suggest that it's important to understand the very imaginaries, dreams, even hopes of these rapidly racist organizations and individuals in order to understand the motivations of their collective imagination. I'd like to suggest that exploring myths of autophony and the desire for homogeneity as the objectives in their fantasies and in their violence. Okay. This is the backdrop. On the eve of the white nationalist demonstrations and counter-protests in Charlottesville, Virginia, on August 14th, 2017, an ensemble of right-wing nationalists, fascists, and Nazi sympathizers gathered in front of several monuments to the Confederacy that, had, Confederacy that had been targeted for demolition. Their chilling, well-rehearsed chant will be familiar to those who viewed the video footage compiled by the reporter embedded in the crowd of mostly, though not exclusively, male uh, white nationalists who marched through the streets with torches and shouted in unison, blood and soil, we will not be replaced. The Jews will not replace us. One of the spokespeople who received the most attention for several days after the events revealed to an interviewer his dream of an ethno state, presumably a state in which the governed and the government were racially unified. Those invocations, in some sense, may seem startling and new, but these invocations contain elements of an older, ancient series of associations, which, as we have discovered, as Professor Kazmitz um, has uh, detailed, um, can be traced back to classical Athens of the 15th century, of blood and soil. In 2017, these white nationals proclaimed their inheritance, not only of the soil of the United States, but the polity as well. Notwithstanding the fact that Jews, blacks, Latinos, the indigenous, and others prohibited from sharing their ethno state could also make similar claims to the same blood and soil. The very language of replacement that they used suggested that the hope for a polity of white nationalists was one in which citizens were born, not made. No amount of religious conversion or socialization could compensate for the inherent limitations of excluded groups. And we can see that now with uh, Trump's efforts to uh, abolish the idea of, uh, or actually the practice of birthright citizenship. Their criteria for white nationalist civic imagery also included a warning of the dangers of miscegenation between white women and non-Aryan men. With, with a clearly articulated desire to protect their women from the clutches of Jews and blacks. There are limits in drawing parallels between the 2000 events in Charlottesville, Virginia and classical Athens. Between the exhortations of fascists and neo-fascists with intellectuals, playwrights and citizens regarding the most preferable form of political life. Yet several formal and substantive parallels can be drawn in a more generalizable conclusion of the relationship between myth and politics. In the classical period, Athens fought off several invasions by outsiders, most notably the Persian army, and instituted criteria designed to restrict and limit citizenship to true Athenians. I'm going to skip some of this here because it was discussed already. Um, the idea that citizens actually literally sprang from the soil. And this became basically the invention of autochthony related to politics. What made the political use of autochthony unique in classical Athens was its definition was based in mythology, not fact. The belief that Athenian citizens after the Persian War were the offspring of people who literally uh, sprang from the soil. This mythology served to naturalize citizenship, making it inaccessible to those who could not prove that they descended from the Ath Athenian soil. Additionally, since citizenship descent became patrilineal, 
a woman, even one descended from a Tocqueville's parents, could not become a citizen, nor could slaves or foreigners. In some sense, our Tocqueville's criteria for citizenship, political membership, also serves as a form of immigration policy, excluding majority of non-Athenians from citizenship. This exclusion and these practices of exclusion do not negate, in my view, the uniqueness of the Athenian democratic experiment. It does, however, complicate our reception of democracy's relation to political and economic equality. Rather than view democracy as a precondition of equality, could it be that social and political inequality is a prerequisite of democracy? Thus, one key lesson to remind ourselves of is how the entwinement of democracy and inequality can be found within processes and outcomes of democratic deliberation. In that democratic deliberation, judgment and action does not guarantee that the democratic outcomes, that democratic outcomes await those who are object of deliberation. I'm talking abstractly, but really about the institution of uh, slavery. Right? It is important to remember the following about Athenian democracy as a complex of citizens, institutions, laws, and customs. It was not designed to incorporate all inhabitants in the territory where democracy resided, but only within the polity, in relation between citizens and government, and what we would now in more contemporary terms refer to as the state. Thus, the idea that a more popular understanding of democracy is a way of life in which all in its vicinity are equal members is not intrinsic to the first instantiation of democracy, nor in many subsequent ones, but actually uh, more, I think, more accurately attributed to or informed by the rise of republicanism and nationalism at two distinct historical moments. Uh, the first uh, beginning in 1789 and the second period being bracketed roughly in the post-war period between about 1945 and 1970 with the rise of nationalism and anti-colonial independence movements. One of my claims is that the race concept became the modern equivalent of autochthony in many Western and Western-influenced nation states. As key variables in the development of citizenship and immigration regimes, policies of education and socialization, the race concept and ensuing hierarchies premised upon it um, provided the means to institutionalize and rationalize hierarchies based upon perceived somatic and phenotypic distinctions which themselves are based upon faulty ideas of biological or even geographic groups, which ultimately had no scientific basis. Formal institutions, laws, edicts provided a scaffolding for the normalization and routinization of such hierarchies, moving them from the realm of the idiosyncratic discretionary decision to making structures of marginalization and domination. Here I'm largely talking about the distinctions between individual preferences, likes and dislikes, and collective ones, which become, in some sense, the structuring conditions for social interaction uh, and formation in a society. And in thinking about the continued legacy of the myth of autochthony or the concept of autochthony um, in the contemporary moment, um, we can think about other examples uh, in much of the contemporary EU, okay, uh, Argentina, Brazil, and the United States, is to make the racial imaginary conterminous with the civic imaginary. Right? Um, I want to give an example, if I don't have a lot of time, but I'll give you some examples of what, I, what I'm talking about here. Uh, first, this is from uh, write, the writings of Woodrow Wilson, 28th president of the United States in an unpublished manuscript on modern democracy titled The Modern Democratic State, uh, he says the following, and he details what he describes as the several all-important conditions for the successful operation of democratic institutions. Number one on his list is homogene homogeneity of race and community of thought and purpose among the people. There's no amalgam of democracy which can harmoniously unite races of diverse habits and instincts, or unequal acquirements in thought and action. A nation once come into maturity and habituated to self-government may absorb alien elements, as our own nation has done and is still doing. Homogeneity is the first requisite for a nation that would be democratic. Okay. I'm going to skip 
it's a lot of this. Um, but I'll sort of do work through one at least one other example. Um, the problem with uh, the contemporary autochthonists, in many ways similar to the early autochthonists, is that they face the same problem when invoking some glorified, unified racial and ethno-national past. There are always other peoples in their midst, peoples who had to be assimilated or incorporated into the nation state. And when that proved politically, socially, and culturally unfeasible, removed or pacified or exterminated. And this is the history of toxicity. So the lesson I would like to emphasize here for a contemporary moment is that population homogeneity, like the category of foreigner and citizen, is a political artifact, not something we find ready-made in the world and not something that ever existed. So much of the origin tales told by various ultra-nationalist ultra and xenophobic movements in the contemporary world rely on stories and genealogies that are themselves uh, mythical. Right? We've been at one last example here of this, um, and that's in the politics of uh, contemporary Italy. Um, it's an interesting uh, case. Recently, after the announcement of a coalition between two right-wing parties of Italy, that formed a national government in 2017, the Five Star Movement and the League, formerly known as the Northern League, announced that it was time for immigrants to pack their bags and get ready to leave Italy. This was actually the day after the election. The League, formerly known as the Northern League in Lombardy, wanted to secede from the rest of Italy and create a new republic evoking images of the Roman Empire called Padania. Right? of some Roman, mythical Roman city-state from the misty past, when Italy was not even really yet Italy, right? um, and also separate from the rest of Italy, particularly southern Italy, right? one of the sort of colloquial expressions in Italy um, that speaks to the sort of racialist discourse in the society is Africa begins at Rome. Right? So that's a way to demarcate the distinction between north uh, and south. But the League, in changing its name from the Northern League to the League, to the League, made an interesting rhetorical move. They claimed, after 2017, to no longer disparage the South, but would be united with the South and with Southerners in their hatred of immigrants coming from Africa. Now, what I've tried to underscore here is how the quest for homogeneity and democracy have been intertwined in the same political project, the project of nation and state, and how racial and ethno-national hierarchy has operated in the nation state system as a filter for citizenship, and thus access to economic as well as political privilege. Two assumptions under, under examination in my brief talk, the quest for homogeneity and the utilization of democratic practices and institutions to privileged citizens and disadvantaged non-citizens are often combined by governments and nationalists during moments of per perceived or actual crisis to further marginalize those populations who are considered either unworthy of particip participation in the polity or more severely excluded from society altogether. How successful right-wing populist movements and ultimately governments are in not only combining these two assumptions but in transforming their ideas in, into institutions provides one way to trace the contours and the limits of democracy in the contemporary world. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I like to start by thanking Professor Hendrick for the invitation to provide some commentary to this last panel. Uh, thank both Professor Norton and Professor Hendrick again for their presentations, and thanks, thanks to everyone for being here uh, this afternoon. Uh, so, in an article first published in 2004, the Portuguese writer and Nobel Prize laureate in literature, José Saramago, wrote, in a world where we are used to debating everything, one, only one taboo persists, democracy, end quote. More than a decade has gone by and little, if anything, has changed. Democracy is, as has been pointed out here today, still often conceived of as the unquestionable endgame of any anti-authoritarian, anti-fundamentalist, and anti-feudal struggle. 
As a result, democracy tends to be continually overrepresented and overconceptualized as an altogether positive system, despite its close interactions with a wide range of exclusionary practices. This conference and the ideas Professor Norton and Professor Henchard have shared with us today are a well-needed theoretical and practical antidote against the sense of complacency that, more often than not, follows democratic discourse in its meandering inside and outside academia. I would like to begin this brief inter intervention by stating the obvious, namely that many arguments in our current conversation about democracy and its antinomies have encountered, as Professor Norton has clearly shown, a steady stimulus in the Trump administration's archaic approach to government, as well as Trump's blatant disregard for democratic procedures and institutions, not to say human dignity and the most basic notions of human equality. These facts, however, have only occasionally become the catalyst for a meaningful conversation about the limits of the democratic itself or about its internal contradictions. Instead, and there is good reason to it, they have generally been debated as a deviation from a democratic path that, despite many of its problems, is still considered, again, not without reason, the model for civility and political life in the 21st century. I believe this conference, and this panel in particular, allow us to consider some very interesting questions about the nature of our present moment. Professor Hanschert has shown how democratic institutions maintain barriers for civic membership and how this active mechanism of exclusion has been historically justified through recourse to notions of autochtony, notions that have been remodeled under the specter of race and institutionalized in the form of racial regimes. In a similar argument, Professor Norton has described how power in the blood, the perennial source of monarchical power, lives on in race, and why embodied hierarchies are not a mere residue of feudalism, but also a liberal pathology, integral to liberalism from its inception. The long durée implied in these two approaches seems to me key in trying to understand the current state of Western democracy as it allows us to move past the shorthand rebuke of its aleatory eccentricities to the critique of the core features that often provide these eccentricities with the fertile ground to develop in the first place. As Professor, as Professor Hanschert suggested, the question then becomes one of the historical and political practice of democracy and of the fundamental continuity that is revealed in the prejudices, racial, religious, ethno-national, that inform policymaking and help shape uh, and, and help shape democratic life in all its forms, from institutional racism to immigration legislation. As I write this, the second wave of migrants in a caravan that has been moving across Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico over the last month has reached the Mexico-US border. The threat posed by this caravan to the imaginary container of national homogeneity and to the political manufacture behind the everyday practice of citizenship has prompted a reaction that allows, in my opinion, to neatly grasp the ongoing patterns and dynamics of exclusion that Professor Hanchard was just referring to. Patterns that govern state discourses and the policies designed to limit access to formal political life. Trump's vociferous reaction to the caravan, particularly in the context of the recent midterm elections, is a case in point. Yet immigration legislation, institutional racism, gendered hierarchies, and all other forms of exclusion that coexist with democracy would fail to account for the persistence of inequality without taking into consideration the economic disparities that, from outside the realm of politics, have stubbornly resisted democratic narratives of civility, equal opportunity, and social stability. Race in America, Professor Norton has poignantly remarked, reveals and conceals the governing power of economic inequality. Selvil Velázquez Cáceres, a Honduran migrant stranded in the Mexican side of the Mexico-US border, declared to a Mexican newspaper moments after his wife and kid jumped over the barbed wire fence used to fortify the so-called wall, effectively turning themselves into custody while, ple while pleading for asylum. And I quote here, we lived in misery. There is nothing to eat. Everything is expensive, very expensive. 
We had to visit the market's garbage dumps in order to find food that wasn't too rotten." End quote. The chilling testimony begets the question, can democracy exist in a world taken hostage by rampant economic inequality? The intimate links discussed by, by Professor Hanchard and Professor Norton today, links between hierarchies of race and gender, between monarch monarchical power and executive authority, authority, between the feudal and the modern, between democracy and discrimination, all seem to point towards an inescapable bond between the realm of the political and the realm of the economic. This being said, I believe it is equally necessary to account for the mutually determined specificities that characterized each of these domains. And therefore, I would like to conclude these remarks by suggesting some questions in this direction that I hope will help jumpstart the conversation around the topics we've been discussing today. In his reflection, Professor Hanchard has underscored the relation between difference and inequality and has established their historical weight as necessary components of what I would like to refer to as actually existing democracy. This being the case, I would like to ask what is, in your opinion, particular to present day racial regimes as opposed to former social formations that have also been ideologically guided by democratic principles, both in discourse and in practice. Professor Norton has presented us with a compelling account of the persistence of the feudal in social democratic regimes, and in particular, the monarchical features of Trump's governing style. My question here is parallel to the one I've posed before, and has to do with your reading of hierarchies of race and gender as surviving structures of a feudal order. If indeed feudal structures have found their way into the world of capital, what does this entail for the struggles around the simple democratic demand that all men are created equal? In other words, what are some of the specific obstacles, this entanglement between feudalism and capitalism, an imbrication that, as you have pointed out, shatters all narratives of linear progress, poses for the struggle against intersecting oppressions? I began this intervention by quoting the Portuguese writer José Saramago, who once wrote, in a world where we are used to debating everything, only one taboo persists, democracy. It is a happy coincidence that José Saramago was born on 16 November 1922, and so today marks his 96th anniversary. I'd like to think that in helping break the taboo of, de of debating democracy, this conference is good reason to believe that for once, the world is changing in the right direction. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, I had a question for Professor Norton. Um, I was wondering um, how your narrative uh, relates to what we today call neoliberalism. Um, I was thinking as I was listening to your presentation about Nancy Fraser and her recent essay when she kind of calls Trump, uh, Trumpism a form of reactionary neoliberalism. Um, and in the same vein, um, if we think of neoliberalism as sort of collapsing the separation of the public and the private, um, which was perhaps a necessary fiction for the successful functioning of capitalism um, for at least throughout the course of the 20th century, um, I'm wondering if then we can see um, neoliberalism as a kind of refutalization of, of, of the relation between the public and the private or the state and the economy. But uh, at the same time, it sounds like you're actually telling a somewhat different story in which uh, feudalism has always been there. So I'm kind of wondering how neoliberalism uh, figures into, into what you're presenting. Oh, you're not collecting them. Okay. Um, I do oh, I increasingly think that the neo and neoliberalism is on less firm ground than the liberalism part. Um, I suppose I think of neoliberalism in some respects as being um, part of a progress from feudalism through liberalism to the present. Um, but I think neoliberalism figures in that much as I think postmodernism figures in modernism. That is to say, it's really late modernity, not postmodernity. And neoliberalism is still liberalism. And I think it still has the pathologies of liberalism. 
I mean, initially, early, much earlier in, in, in my life, I was very interested in the increasing abstraction that things that were initially seemed very material and bodily became ever more abstract, ever more quantifiable, ever more represented. And, um, but it occurred to me at a certain point that that fails, that, that that may describe politics well, but it doesn't really, it describes economics only on the surface and that economic relations as they are experienced by people in their material relations are fundamentally still intensely bodily relations. That is to say, it's about getting your food from the trash because you must. And there I think, so I, I, um, I don't, I think it's important not to lose sight of that increasing abstraction and the emphasis on pro, a procedure and quantification. But at the present moment, I feel that, I feel that's a really bad thing to say. I think we should um, attend with, with um, special force to that kind of common materiality that on the one hand binds us in a condition of precarity, but also that binds these seemingly progressive epochs to one another in a way that is much less heartening and, and much more dispiriting. Any other questions? We'll take a couple at a time this time. Yes? Thank you both for your presentations and for the great comments. Um, and I had a question about uh, feudalism, feudal monarchy. It strikes me that the feudal monarchy of the past, um, uh, you could not criticize the monarch. That's a traditional regulation. You get in big trouble if you're mocking or criticizing the monarch. And that aspect of feudalism doesn't seem to be with us. If anything, it seems part of the phenomenon of, of Trump that there's a buffoonery and um, a, uh, that, that, and an entertainment aspect caught up with that. And so, how stable is the current right to criticize the the quasi monarch? Um, what are your you know predictions of of, of it maintaining that that ability, and uh, how different does that make our present um, feudal monarchy from the past? That there is this enduring ability to to mock and criticize. Take a few questions in turn to. Jimmy's next. Jeff, Jeff follows. Um, I have comments, I guess, for or questions for both um, papers, which I really enjoyed, and the comments were also great, and they're making me try to connect um, both talks. So the first might be about autophony, and the thing that I left out this morning, is, and, but that is very um, apparent in all the literature on autophony, that I think you and I are trying to push back against is the fact that it's a unifying discourse for the demos once power has been wrested from, taken from the elites. And so it's a way for the demos suddenly to have this identity, the civic identity, and overcome differences, socioeconomic differences. So that strikes me as, even though I like to write against that, that strikes me as very important to recuperate maybe as a way of creating more daylight between the ancient and the, and the contemporary. Because what we're, what we're seeing with the resurgence of these, this sort of nationalism and nativism is not a, a taking power back from the elites, but a way of somehow coming to terms with this kind of disparity. So I wonder if there's, there's something you could say about um, autophony as a response to that particular political reality as opposed to this one. And then for Anne, I just, I guess I wanted to understand a little bit better a couple of things in your talk, and it might be that I really just didn't, I missed it, but I guess the relationship between Trump's body, which you do such a good job of, of bringing out, and the way he, it's, he's so self-referential, and then the economic as a site, almost like an exceptional space where you, you were saying that um, certain political demands or rights are irrelevant, um, people can't make the same kinds of claims that they would outside of that space. And maybe it's the, the um, I don't know, the overreach and the spread of the economic that you're trying into the political, or that's what he's, he stands for, the feudal. I guess I just want to understand the relationship between body, the economic, and um, the feudal a little bit better. And then finally, in response to the comments, I'm thinking about the caravan and 
the way and the economic and the way in which the caravan becomes the kind of open secret um, that of of this kind of economic um, oppression that the U.S. has been involved in uh, around the world, and the way that you, as a feudal lord or a feudal or a king, try to distract from that is by making it into an invasion, a territorial invasion. Um, but that's the, either so it's either the open secret, or it's the thing that we can't really look at, um, and so it gets recoded as. Um, well, thank you so much for both uh, very thought-provoking presentations as well as comments. Um, I, I'm not sure my question is really a question or a comment. I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, starting, you know, I'm trying to formulate it as, as I'm talking, so I'm, I'm sure it will be somewhat incoherent. But as we approach the end of the, of the day, um, I'm thinking that to a large extent, the antinomies uh, that we've been talking about throughout the day were the antinomies of liberal democracy and it has existed either in Greece, so before mm -hmm. the, 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 the creation of the nation state, or after the European revolutions with the nation state. However, throughout several presentations, and I think this became um, sort of, uh, this was revived with, with the idea of feudalism in both corporate practices with regards to labor as well as with the, the way in which power is exercised in the executive. This brought back a comment that Jeffrey made um, at the beginning of the day that oligarchic power was enhanced by globalization, but people power was not, which in a certain way I think reflected the fact that that money and goods are, are uh, highly mobile, while people are not, and this ties back to the issue of the caravan. And it reminds me of a comment that, that, that the other chef, Reed Green, made about how do we get out of this? You know, can we think about these antinomies or, or some of the, of the tensions that were raised in the first panel in a world with borders? Should we be thinking with our borders? So, so what I'm trying to do is, is to try to think if we are facing a crisis of globalization and, and the entrenchment of, of nationalism and anti-immigration that we see as being pervasive in Europe, in the US, and now in Latin America, where the anti-immigrant discourse is becoming, unfortunately, very pervasive. Um, uh, are we seeing a crisis of, of globalization, and is this a crisis of, of corporate capitalism, or is it only a crisis of what the sort of side benefits of, of globalization have been, which is that we'll give a blind eye to the issue of immigration to the extent that we can, and you know, let some movement uh, operate while, while we um, uh, sort of extract the most benefits from financial integration uh, and and trade liberalization. So I'm not sure if we are facing a crisis of neoliberalism, if it's a crisis of a certain type of, of globalization or what it is, but it seems that we continue to address antinomies that are that are situated in na nation state while some of the challenges are coming clearly from a crisis of the global order. Could I direct a quick question to Michael? I'm very short. Um, it seems that the fundamental claims of indigenous people, the, the legitimacy of their claims, um, are based in autochthony. And so would a sort of amendment to, to your attack, which I think your critique is incredibly powerful, um, is autochthony odious when it is invoked by powerful people, um, but has a completely different character when um, oppressed people invoke it. And alternatively, is, is there some other basis um, that that <coughs> people should have for legitimate claims? Let's, let's respond to those questions. And, yeah. Um, these are great questions. Um, thanks to Pavel also for great uh, 
commentary. I'm going to provide. Yeah, I'm going to provide some, uh, some responses uh, at random, so not in any particular um, order. I mean, think in respect to Tulia and both Jeff's comments prompted by the gentleman's uh, question, um, I think it's important to remember a couple of things I'll say. Um, that democracy predates both liberalism and capitalism, right? Um, and so what we're talking about, what is it about, uh, are there intrinsic features to democracy and democratic practices that produces certain kinds of inequality? Um, and I think that if we look, um, I, I do go into this in the book, and I didn't have time to do it here, but if we understand and, and really examine the relationship between capitalism and slavery, I think we understand a couple of things. That one, uh, one could argue that the modern racial slavery was one of the, the first major forces of globalization in the modern world, right? So globalization in itself, of itself is not a new thing. Um, my uh, late great, one of my advisors, uh, the great Brazilian historian, Emilia Vialti da Costa, uh, she came up with a concept which she referred to as conservative liberalism. And by that, she meant the ways in which elites in Latin America, Creole elites, who wanted the economic benefits of liberalism, but did not want to ex extend its political benefits, because the political benefits taken to a more radical conclusion could lead to forms of egalitarianism, or the prospect of egalitarianism, right? And these new elites didn't want that, of course, to, to, to happen, right? So if we think about this more historically, then, it's not so much that these phenomena, they're new, but they're part of a, a process, right? Or even a genealogy, right? So if we think about the relationship between capitalism and slavery, for example, I'll just give you some anecdotes. So, so, you know, Wall Street, it was located where it was because it was a site of major slave auctions in New York City. And it was a symbol of the economic greatness of the capitalists who invested in the slave trade, and then which would help feed mercantilism, right? So, you know, those kind the, the, the accommodations that liberalism is often made, right, with institutions and practices that continuously create and maintain and sustain inequality is, is an old, it's an old tale. So many of, uh, many sort of major liberal economists we can think of uh, were involved very, very specifically in the Dutch. East India Company, I mean, they went in imperial practices. So this is not some uh, real contradiction. When we think about the work of someone like Tom Holt uh, in The Problem of Freedom, uh, it's a great book where he consistently shows that the edicts that came from Britain or France about how to treat slaves, giving them Sundays off, educating them, in the colonies were entirely subordinated to the needs of production, right? And so... There are these different junctures when, in one way, we could think of the potentiality for liberalism as, as fighting words, right, as a more sort of radical notion of, or a take on, for lack of a better term, collectivity, right, instead of something that constantly makes appeasements, right, in part as a means to profit, right. So John Hobson, uh, the book that Lenin uh, quibbed off of, um, his great book, Imperialism at the Turn of the Century, rails against British liberals precisely for this, that, that in many ways their interface with, with slavery represented a lost, lost opportunity for a radical version of liberalism and basically enabled, in some sense, this more cozy relationship between liberalism and slavery. Um, in relation to the contemporary question, um, uh, someone mentioned the question of monarchy. Demi, right? Right, right? Um, uh, that autochthony, autochthony, I'm sorry, right. That one of the, I think that the key difference in the contemporary moment um, is that, and when I say contemporary, I'm really talking about late 1970s, when the resurgence after civil rights movements in different parts of the world um, by the new autochthonists. The design, the, the aim was not so much to represent or defend the elites, but to fuse race or ethnicity or even religion as instruments to dismantle the welfare state and instruments to dismantle the idea of a social contract 
after 1945. Because if you think about all of the discourses, whether in Britain, right, these Pakis or, you know, these blacks from the Caribbean and Africa, they're all in a dole. So make me, you know, take them from us. You know, the idea of uh, the, the welfare queens, right, in, uh, in the United States. Um, there was a great article years ago done by a public interest research group where they basically doxed and revealed uh, in an article in the New York Times the agribusinesses that basically get the most subsidies, economic subsidies, from the U.S. government. And they interviewed one of them uh, to get his reaction. And he said, when he saw it, he was shocked. He said, they're basically characterizing me as if I'm a single black mother on welfare on the south side of Chicago. Right? That was his parallel. Right? That was his parallel. Right? And, but no one, so the idea somehow that he would be on the dole, right, and actually more implicit right, in dismantling the welfare state, because he's already wealthy, right, and somehow it's this already marginalized population, that somehow they are not, that, it, that, that they get in the way of the white working class and middle class to get certain benefits and advantages. Um, I think that's very palpable. You know, the language of the Northern League, of the League, which I uh, was, um, it would manifested itself in another way. In the city of Trieste, for example, the mayor of Trieste, and the irony here is that uh, in, Trieste, in Italy, particularly in the north, they subsidized uh, immigration from Ethiopia and Eritrea, particularly because there was a lack of domestic work, workers. And the domestic workers had a habit in the afternoons of congregating from different homes they cared for um, in the public parks. Well, this infuriated the mayor. So what he did was he pulled out all the park benches in the public parks. Now, this seems ridiculous, but you know, and it is. But one way to think about it is it's really the denial of public goods. Right? That's really what the, what the, what the stakes are. Um, you know, the problem with Trump and mockery is that it's never quite clear where it is. That is to say, to what extent he, he constantly exposes himself to ridicule, but appears to be entirely unconscious of this. And I think he is, in his own view, unmockable. And that initially, early in his, early in his term, he not only attempted to limit speech about the presidency in a sort of recollection of the Alien and Sedition Acts, but he also staged that fascinatingly monarchical moment when his cabinet was invited to praise him as if he were Hafez al-Assad or somebody. And it was, it was fascinating. It was intensely laughable. And I think that that is one of those moments where you see that I didn't, I didn't talk about the contestation of Trump, but there are many really important moments in which his making explicit certain things also produced what calls itself a resistance. And some of it is that, you know, that aristocracy falls by being laughed at, that the, the sort of the investment, I mean, Achille and Bembe has some great stuff on this in on the post-colony about laughing at the leader and how, laugh, how important laughing at the leader is. Um, it did make me wonder which leaders we can laugh at, or which, and when one thinks of corporate figures, there's really very little effort to make fun of them, and yet it would really be very easy. And it fascinates me that, that, that they enjoy that kind of, of immunity. Um, now, uh, I, I, I don't do a good enough job of, of making all these connections. I'll try and do a slightly better job here. Um, I think that on the one hand, Trump is claiming this power in the blood through his ability to install his family in these quasi-dynastic positions and his indifference to whether or not they have any qualifications at all or represent anyone at all or do anything at all. Um, this, that, the second place that that power in the blood shows itself in my account and the more important place is in the, the transformation of um, the power of the Lord into the power, into white supremacy on the one hand, into, um, into patriarchy on the other, that those are, that that's the transformation that links it to liberalism, that the transformation that liberalism quite literally imports with the law. Um, and I think there are two examples. One, um, and I, I should have talked about it more, but probably maybe not. You know, you all remember that, that funny, a photograph of the Trumps in their apartment. 
Well, you know, it is not. It is fascinating that the child is named Baron. I mean, uh, something which in it simultaneously unites a financial magazine, that is to say, what the the mouthpiece of capital, and um, and a title of nobility. Like, what is up with that? And there he is riding a lion. I mean, you can't mock this. It is self-mocking. It's like those self-rising cakes or something. Um, and so that, so I think Baron is is himself a kind of symptom of the plate. One of the places where, um, where. On the one hand, the discourse of race and the discourse of capital meet. On the other hand, where family power meets capital. Um, but what should I say? Sorry. Okay, but you're, uh, I think you're with me on that. Um, but the much more important one is that the transmogrification that carries it over, transmutation that carries it over. Um, uh, who else asked me a question? There's a, there's a question here which I now don't remember who asked. Um, and it wasn't you. <laughs> um, oh, oh, who asked this question? It's Tulia. Um, the, I love this question so very much. Um, I, I mean, to cut to the bottom line, I don't think it's a crisis of capital. I wish it was. I feel it has taken me most of my life to see how thoroughly capital operates and that um, I have no hope of seeing in my lifetime any significant amendment of this, but one never knows. Um, and uh, one, can hope. The, yeah, one can hope, exactly, one can hope. And, but the, the part that I, I, um, I have to do two things, but I have to thank you, especially for Sarah Mago. Um, it's really great. And the second is, I have to register, however briefly, uh, that Greece cannot, be, Athens cannot be the limit. I mean, the idea that Athens is the limit, I think your work actually works against this in really powerful ways, but the idea that there's a founding moment for democracy, this is this is so antithetical to the, to the idea of democracy. Plus, as I always tell you, the Vikings were ever so much better. Um, and they were not. And they were interestingly not bad. They could care less about autocracy. They had no investment in it whatsoever. And anyone who happened to be present could vote, unless they were a slave. And they might not. You know, and, they, and even then, there were some questions about it. So sorry, I had to get my word in for the Vikings. Let me respond uh, quickly. I realized I didn't answer Jeff's question, and I got a, a, a comment. Um, so I think that's a great question. Um, you actually posed this to me before, I remember. Um, is that if we think about like history, and, and Tulia can come in and either agree or rebut my assumptions here, if we think about the history of indigenous movements, not just in the United States, but certainly New Zealand and Australia, um, you know, set against the backdrop, set against the backdrop of the nation-state system, that those um, appeals to autochthony more often than not came at moments when indigenous populations were forced to be sedentary, right? Whether they, they moved to reserves, whether uh, land that they formerly roamed upon or, or had a nomadic relationship with um, no longer became an option, right? Um, and so it's not that all moves are toxic adaptively, but if you think about, I think it's the, the sewer the Cree, who, um, I mean, the, the famous case that goes up before um, the Supreme Court, and it decides that these two groups of indigenous people uh, represent a sovereign but dependent nation, mm. right? So that basically meant that they could be a nationality, but they could not be a state. And one way of looking at that is they utilized the language of statehood and nation statehood, in part because there was some political purchase or comment and political purchase or instrumentality that they thought could be gained, right? Um, so, so that's that, that that that's one part of it. Um, I hope I, that I answered the question there. Um, Can I piggyback no, on this? Because one of the interesting things about indigeneity for me is that the and I know the American example is better, much yeah. better, is that. Um, that most of most of the tribes had robust adoption practices. That's right. So that you get groups like the Seminole, and it didn't matter. They had it was it was it was an autochthony that was not tied to race, and it had a very it appears to have had a, a largely metaphoric tie to the right of a first occupier. 
So it is, I think, a different conception of, of autophony. I mean, I think the fact that it isn't about purity of the blood, apart from power in the blood, is really significant for Michael's purposes. Yeah, I know. Those are um, purposes. One other comment I'll throw in here, because it hasn't really been discussed. We think about the contemporary moment um, in terms of racial politics and the question of governance. So basically the conjunction of, of race and state. Um, so much of the, this, this contemporary discourse, particularly on the right, um, and with the prolif proliferation of uh, white supremacist groups, reminds me a lot of the period immediately after Reconstruction. If you think about Reconstruction as a, as a kind of aborted project, or going to blossom, and the right-wing historiography right, that emerged. So you actually had, in certain cases, um, planters who decided to announce and did with minimal trend. They declared themselves historians in order to write books about slavery and about the U.S. South and to basically counter notions that somehow was brutal and cruel and that these people needed uh, management and they needed tutelage because on their own, you know, they, could, they, would, they, they would suffer. And if we think about, um, you know, if we think about the Republican Party's response to Obama, right, and I'm not, never forget when Jim Boehner announced essentially that he and his cohort would rather that the state not function, right, than to uh, accede to, to any of Obama's demands. One is personalizing it, right? But also in some sense that this can't be our state because, it, because a black man is at the head of it, right? We will then render the, that state dysfunctional. And if you read uh, Du Bois's discussion in, in the Black Reconstruction, um, if you read uh, Eric Foner, uh, Stephen Hahn, right? right? I mean, part of what Hahn talks about is the ways in which you know, much of Reconstruction was limited because of the rise of paramilitary groups and not just the Klan groups like the Regulators and a whole host of other groups, right? How different is that from, how different from that, this moment? So in other words, anxiety is about black participation in political life, right? And try to find extrajudiciary paramilitary means to oppress that. You can think about voting purges in this way, you can think about the use of, of felony, right? And also dynamics and tactics. So to give you one example, and I'm going to shut up. So Barbara Ar Armwine was one of the leading uh, figures in the past 30 years in, try in going to and pressing cases state by state to remind governors that felons can actually vote, right? If they pay their, done their, paid their debt to society, they should not be prohibited from voting for the rest of their life. Um, she was retaliated against several times. That after, you know, she lives in D.C. The SWAT teams would come to her house, break in, tear up a whole bunch of stuff, and say, oops, wrong house, wrong warrant, three, four times, right? I mean, so these are, and, and, and these are state actors, right? This is, this is not the Klan rolling in. But we also know that in many cases, particularly now with new, new forms of right-wing mobilization, that one of the things they exclusively pursue, not exclusively, but largely pursue, is to try to attract white military men, right? Because of their knowledge, right? And their ability to train people in the use of violence. That's not that different from people in the 60s and 50s. Byron De La Beckwith, right, was an explosion an explosives expert, right? So these kinds of things, and we sort of think about all this under the banner of, you know, a liberal polity, right? You could talk about it as a kind of racial liberalism, but a more fully egalitarian liberal society. That I, that I don't think we've seen yet. Right? John Rawls notwithstanding. <laughs> I'll ask a, a quick question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. This is a question for Anne. It's kind of a quick question, and I, tell me if it, you've, in a sense, answered this in a different form already. But as soon as you started talking about feudalism, I thought, you know, sort of, where's Marx in this? Is this a Marxist scheme, schema or not? Because there could be a version where sort of, you know, Arno Mayer, the persistence of the old regime that were still basically feudal, except now it's not the First World War. It's 100 years later. Or it could be that... We, all of this feudalism is essentially a kind of ironic performance at this point that, you know, it's, it's all a little bit with a wink that, um, even though if Marie Antoinette played it being a shepherd, uh, 
Trump names his kid Baron and puts on a, and plays it being in a kind of fake Versailles, and that other times he tries on populism with a similar kind of wink. So I wonder, you know, in a Marxist account, there'd sort of be a, a legal or structural residue of feudalism that's still infusing a kind of late capitalist bourgeois world. In a, in a different version, feudalism would be something more like a symbolic universe that you could call upon um, as much for its entertainment value as anything else. And so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking you which you mean. Um, I don't think it's a symbolic universe. I think there is a symbolic universe, but I think um, I think Karen Oren's Belated Feudalism is a brilliant book that is much more revolutionary than she appreciates. Um, I mean, it seems to me that when you ca make the case that American labor law, which was imported from the British and hence remains in Brit active in Britain, was the law of master and servant. And then when you look at how a job works, for a worker, for an ordinary working person, really at any level almost, um, that, that, that all of a sudden you realize, no, it is the structure that survives. It is the legal structure. Mm -hmm. It is the legally formed rela relation. It's not, it's not the romance of the princess. It's the, it's the pay of the worker. And is it, I mean, is that the same as the sort of bourgeois liberal order? Are they essentially, in other words, yes. are you saying feudalism yes. and the bourgeois liberal order are really just a difference? They're not that They're not different, that different is the not argument. That different. Okay. And the, in that sense, I'm obviously not. Um, I'm obviously somewhat, I'm, I'm very suspicious of the Marxist scheme for the same reason, par, partly for the same reason I was suspicious of the Hegelian scheme is like, it really only goes in one direction. Like, mm -hmm. why? And, um, but also because so much of it does seem to persist. I mean, it might be a very long durée indeed. And, but um, the, I think the fact that these structures persist and that the liberal revolutions really don't go very deep. That is to say, they leave, they leave much of social relations untouched, although I think they do more for social relations than is often acknowledged. But they leave, they leave the economy almost completely untouched. And the economy then continues to, to batten off what is preserved from feudalism. So, you know, the unpaid labor of women, the unpaid labor of slaves, the ability to sell your slaves, the, to, to trade them as Judah Benjamin did for shares in the Illinois Central Railroad. I mean, that's just astonishing. Um, that really those suggest that in the economic realm, feudalism doesn't lead with the liberal revolutions. And that, that it seems to me, means that, that something has not been as much dislodged as even, I think, Marx thought that it was. The person with the mic, that's the last question. You have the last question. You can get that one more. Okay, I was going to say, I'll, I'll try to make it good. Um, I have a question for Professor Henshard about orthogony. If I understand the concept correctly, it has to do with the relationship between a particular people and a particular territory, and beyond territory, a particular soil, a soil which is endowed with mythical, sacred, extraordinary qualities, almost a personality. And I'm just curious uh, if you have any thoughts on the, how this happens, uh, with the kind of practices, rituals, acts uh, through which ordinary soil becomes a hallowed ground. Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that one. Um, but I, I, what I would say in some sense would be to reiterate a comment that, uh, that Professor Kazimitz made in some sense is to create this uh, kind of civic community, right? And that, uh, and I deal with some of this in the book, that it's in moments of perceived or actual crisis where ideas about autochthony uh, become very, very prominent in politics, at least in terms of the history of the nation state system. If we think about uh, the Third Reich, for example, I mean, this is the more extreme version, but you know, this was part of the rationale for the thousand year right, basically to render the German soil clear of non-Aryans, right? And his plan, which he didn't get to 
um, implement um, because of Stalingrad was basically to have developed this whole scheme of population transfer and, he, and, and, and what we're now former Soviet, but also the Eastern Europe more generally, to move and shift so-called inferior populations around and concentrate them in certain areas and having superior populations in other areas. Um, and this is in many ways articulated in the, the, the exhortations or the rhetoric, right, about purification that we find in all fascist movements, even the contemporary ones. Rising Dawn, for example, uh, in Greece, used a lot of uh, this language. In, in Italy, for example, Umberto Bossi, uses a lot of this kind of language. So I don't think, well, well we're not really talking about that, that there's something inherently special in a particular type of soil other than, than, than others, but that these are constructions designed to justify and create a new uh, political community at the exclusion of people who may have been there and also who may have lived on the, ter on the territory. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Just to underscore that it didn't matter if you were actually born on the physical earth, right? That's the whole weird part about the soil. Right. It's about ye, about the goddess Earth, and that you could, and also this other myth uh, about Erechtheus. And so, in a way, that the importance of territory is something for soil is something you can only track through blood, through intergenerationality, which is right. the reason it links back to indigeneity is that it comes at a moment. The contemporary politics of indigeneity works in exactly the opposite way. One last one. That's yeah. One last one. Yeah, PJ. Oh yeah, just on, on the autochthony yesterday and today, the continuity and change of, um, as as Professor Norton rightly said, it, indigenous groups don't understand themselves by way of their consanguinity, right? So, given that, then I'm just wondering about our trying to make sense of our contemporary moment where we start to make ourselves let, try to make ourselves legible to other people as well as ourselves by way of, of DNA. And I'm thinking of the, mm -hmm. so, so if Mike, as you were saying, um, will race and religion become tools to dismantle the welfare state then, is there a kind of circling back of the use of autochthony vis-a-vis -vis DNA? So that becomes a tool uh, to fortify the settler state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's, a, it's the way I characterize it, it's really a set of political claims um, and a way to try to naturalize the category of the citizen, wherever he or she may be. Because in all these instances, there are people who could lay some prior claim to that same territory as their own, right? Um, but that doesn't really matter because somehow, and this is, you know, certainly with 19th century racism and ideas of a sort of the Teutonic myth that Aryans or Germans were the, were the state makers par excellence. What was central was not so much that they were the first people, even though according to the lie they were, but what it was that they were the best state makers on the planet. So you had a lot of students of politics making these hierarchies, not based on biological assumptions of race, but which societies and which people were the best state makers. And so the Teutonics were on, on the top. Right. I mean, Wilson has a long discussion of this, for example, in, uh, in the state, where at one point he's at pains to say, um, I'm not opposed to uh, blacks in the South because they're black. I'm opposed to them because their minds are dark. Their minds have not been illuminated yet. And they don't really understand the machinations of state power. How are they going to run a republic when there's no history? Right. So then it comes back to you know, like the literary parallel of someone like a Saul Bell, right, who'll say, you know, when you can show me Tolstoy among the pygmies, then, you know, I can talk to you about pygmy literature. But until then, you know. All right. Thank you so much on that note. <laughs>